music does a lot of things for a lot of people. It's transporting for sure. It can take you right back, years back, to the very moment certain things happened in your life. It's uplifting, it's encouraging, it's strengthening. Um, so I wanted to start out with this quote from the late Aretha Franklin, and I've highlighted in bold, in particular, the experience that I want to talk about today, which Herb has already alluded to, the idea that music can take us right back, transport us back to the very moment things happened in our lives. Um, and this is uh, the idea that music is somehow a particularly powerful or a particularly effective cue for autobiographical memories. Um, and this idea, if you um, look through literary sources and media sources about music, you, you see this coming up a lot in famous quotes and, and so on. Um, but more recently, uh, psychologists have been interested in trying to really unpack this idea and see if it really holds up scientifically. So is music a more powerful cue for autobiographical memories? So this idea that music is somehow linked uh, to uh, more, a more, more powerful cue for memories from our past, um, has stood up in some scientific research. For instance, it's been shown that music evokes more vivid or more emotional memories from our lives um, than, for instance, various other everyday uh, cues in our life like uh, photographs or um, uh, clips from TV shows or clips from films or so on. Um, but what I really want to uh, try and unpack today is this question of why. Um, so why is it the case that music seems to be a particularly good cue and particularly entwined with memories from our lives? Um, so I'll uh, go through a few strands of scientific research where we've been trying to unpack this um, within the field of music psychology. Uh, before I go into the sort of main body of the talk, I just want to talk a bit about why does it matter. So uh, other than for researchers, why would we want to know about the link between music and memory? Uh, why is it an important sort of problem to solve in the first place, right? Um, so firstly, uh, you might be aware that music is increasingly used in therapeutic contexts for people with memory disorders, for instance. Um, so you may have seen these uh, famous examples on YouTube and so on of people with dementia uh, seeming to suddenly be re reconnected with their youth when they're listening to music and so on. Um, so a lot of these um, examples have come up and have been cited uh, in, in various uh, cases, and you've probably maybe even seen cases in your own life of this experience if you have relatives and so on. Um, but this... Uh, the, the ex explanation of why this happens is, is still very, very preliminary. Um, so we don't really fully understand why music might be a spared cue uh, for memories in these particular cases. Um, so if we actually do scientific research that tries to unpack um, the mechanisms between why music is so inherently connected to autobiographical memory, this um, will potentially enable us to um, refine such interventions, make them more effective, and so on. Um, so more broadly, if we think about um, beyond cases of memory disorders, if we think about everyday well-being, um, there are various implications as well. So um, uh, essentially, um, when we think, uh, when we retrieve personally significant memories from our lives, uh, this can actually have psychological benefits uh, to us. Uh, so when we retrieve uh, important memories from our lives, this um, uh, kind of reconnects us with our sense of self uh, and can actually uh, boost life satisfaction and make us have uh, an increased sense of life purpose and so on. Uh, finally, uh, so companies such as music streaming services like Spotify are constantly trying to optimize the suggestions that they provide to their listeners um, uh, and personalize them uh, uh, through research in this area. So um, research in this area is already being used to inform uh, these kind of uh, recommendation algorithms. Uh, so uh, potentially uh, these types of services can, for instance, select more autobiographically relevant uh, uh, pieces of music for their listeners based on, for instance, their demographic factors and um, their listening history and so on. Okay, so um, moving on to the kind of main uh, body of the talk. Now I want to talk, uh, I want you to think about this question uh, and I'm going to play you some excerpts of music. Um, so this is a sort of miniature version of an experiment that I might do in my lab uh, uh, 
over in Durham. Uh, so I'm going to play you a set of songs and just think how much does the set of songs evoke memories from your life and make a rating on a scale of one to three. Okay, so um, make a rating and, and think, uh, well, jot it down to yourself. And now here's another set of songs, and I want you to again think um, on a scale of one to three what rating you would give this set of songs. <laughs> Okay, so if you gave a rating of three to the first set of songs, I would uh, approximate that you were born in around 1985 or so. Um, and if you gave a rating of three to the second set of songs, I would guess you were born around 1970-ish. Um, I obviously probably didn't get this right for every single one of you because you're humans and not robots and you have your own idiosyncratic listening habits. Um, however, when we average responses across lots and lots of participants, like we do in psychology research, um, this is precisely what we find. So we find that music that people, that was either released during people's teenage years or that they listened to a lot during their teenage years, serves as a better cue for autobiographical memories later on in their lives than music from other time periods. Um, so this is just to demonstrate uh, the first point I want to make, that musical memory is inherently linked to the most important period in human development in terms of identity formation, which is our adolescent years. So this, this phenomenon is known as the reminiscence bump, this, this phenomenon whereby music from our teenage years is a better cue for autobiographical memories. And the reminiscence bump um, is actually not specific to music. So for instance, films or books from this time period um, also are better triggers for memories from our lives later on uh, down the line than other films and books, for instance. Um, but, the, but it's been shown that the music-related reminiscence bump is more pronounced than the reminiscence bump for other cultural products like films and books. So music um, seems to be uh, one of the cultural products that's the most uh, inherently entwined with this uh, period in identity formation. Um, so, I want you to turn now, turn now to a second question, which is, how many times have you heard your favorite song? Probably lots and lots of times, right? Um, more than you can even count. So that's just to reinforce the idea that uh, we listen to songs over and over so many times. So coming to my next demonstration, I want to play you some clips of music, and I just want you to tell me what song this is. <laughs> what song is that? Yeah. And what song is this? Yes, fantastic. Um, so that's just to demonstrate. So those clips of music are 400 milliseconds long. And that's just to demonstrate how exceptionally good our memory for music is. Um, so it's been shown consistently in research that um, people, uh, if you know a song really well, you need less than half a second to identify it. Because um, well-known music uh, is so well recognized and our memory is so exceptionally good. This is one of the reasons that it can also potentially serve as a really good cue for associated memories from our lives. So when we, when we do this re-listening of the same songs over and over as well, um, this also can counteract forgetting of associated autobiographical memories by regularly reinstating those memories in our minds. Um, so uh, if you're listening to that same song on lots and lots of occasions and it's reminding you, you of your wedding day, you're sort of reconsolidating that memory in mind. Um, this, it's a bit of a double-edged sword though in that Obviously, if we listen to the same piece of music lots and lots in different contexts during different events, then um, we, this can lead to what we call overgeneral memories. So rather than a piece of music being associated with one single event, it gets associated with maybe your teenage years in general, 
or the summer of 1969 in general, for instance, right? Um, so this has been well documented also in, in, in research on this topic that music seems to be a particularly good cue for general time periods and longer periods of time from our lives. Um, so finally, music is inherently emotional. Um, I probably don't need to tell you that. That's one of the main reasons we listen to music. Um, but if we think about um, autobiographical memory specifically, um, it's been shown uh, very consistently that emotional events are remembered better than non-emotional ones. Um, so in my recent research, I really I wanted to put this power of music to the test by seeing uh, what if we compare music against other equally emotional memory cues. Um, so said another way, uh, is music still a particularly powerful cue for memories from our lives if we compare it against equivalently emotional stimuli? Um, so what we did here is we took music and compared it against sounds and other words as cues for autobiographical memories in four experiments. Um, so essentially what we did is we took uh, loads of pieces of music, loads of sounds, and loads of words, and we had lots of participants rating how emotional they were in terms of how positive or negative they were, or how um, relaxing or energizing they were. And then from that we could essentially select um, pieces of music that were matched to sounds and words in terms of their emotional content. So for example, we used uh, this piece of music, here's a short clip of it. Uh, and that was matched to this sound. And that was matched to the word tornado. Um, so we build up lots of these sets of clips that are matched, um, and then we present them in, in new experiments to uh, participants where they just hear one of these or see one word, and they're asked to recall an autobiographical memory in response to each of these cues. Um, so one of the main results that we found across all of the studies um, is visualized here. So if you look at the x-axis, which uh, says Q valence at the bottom there, where it says negative and positive, this, this refers to whether the Q itself was negative or positive. So for instance, um, a sad or angry piece of music is negative, a happy or positive piece of music is, is positive, or sorry, a happy or peaceful piece, happy or peaceful piece of music is positive. That's a tongue twister. Um, on the y-axis, what you have is uh, the ratings of the emotion of the autobiographical memories themselves. So um, as it gets higher, they're more positive memories. And essentially what we found was that regardless of its emotional expression, uh, music evoked more uniformly positive memories. So regardless of whether the music was happy, sad, angry, peaceful, it was uh, evoking relatively positive memories from people's lives. And that wasn't the case for the sounds or the word cues that we used. So more negative sounds or more negative words were evoking more negative memories. Um, so there seems to be something particularly special about music in its sort of unique ability to evict evoke more consistently positive memories from across our lifetimes. Um, so finally, just linking into that, I wanted to ask about what about newly formed memories. Um, so one thing about the previous studies that we've done is that we asked people to recall any autobiographical memory from their life that had previously happened to them. So one explanation for music evoking more positive memories is that music might just occur during more positive events in our lives than, than other things. Um, so what if we simulate the creation of new autobiographical memories in an experiment? Um, so what we did is we took the same music and sound cues that were matched on their emotional expression, and we made people uh, essentially encode new autobiographical memories so that we could actually compare music to other sounds as cues for the same events. Um, so we can see, is music still somehow special uh, when uh, serving as a memory cue for the exact same set of events? Um, so to give one example, uh, here's one scene that people saw. So half of the participants saw that kind of version, whereas half of the participants saw this kind of version. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, essentially they saw lots of these videos that were coupled to either music, music or sounds. Um, and then they had a surprise memory test at the end where they just um, heard a piece of music or saw a sound without any visual content and they were asked to retrieve um, and recall the associated visual scenes. So they had to describe it to us um, and from that we could score how, um, how many details they got correct and whether they got it correct in the first place and uh, they made various ratings about the um, memories as well. And what we found uh, was that when the scenes were cued by music, they were rated as more emotionally positive and more relaxing than when they were cued by sounds. Uh, which is quite striking because, as you've seen, the events themselves were exactly the same. Um, so this suggests that music may actually bias us to recall events in a more positive light than other um, everyday cues in our environment. Okay, so to conclude, um, I've been talking today about how we can explain the power of music in memory, and I've given you an overview of three uh, different areas uh, that I think are quite crucial. So thinking about music's role in identity, the way in which we frequently uh, and regularly re-engage with music, and this emotional positivity bias, uh, whereby uh, music seems to uh, be particularly good at evoking positive memories or perhaps reframing memories in a more positive light. Um, so to conclude, um, we already use music in our everyday lives to boost our moods, help us relax, and so on. This is probably something you do quite intuitively and quite regularly. Um, but this link between music and memory is perhaps something that you've, less, you've thought about less consciously. Um, so the next time you're feeling a bit down, try using music from particularly important time periods in your life um, to reconnect with long forgotten memories, uh, which can boost your sense of purpose and reconnect you with the people and experiences who've made who you are today. Thank you. So just, just one quick question as we're running a little late, yeah. but uh, am I, did I hear you correctly at the end with, with regard to this idea, because no one thinks, and I don't think about, um, you know, uh, playing music purposely linked to memory that ha when I have therapeutic positive things, although generally speaking it does. Mm -hmm. And I've seen all kinds of, um, I remember seeing a presentation about um, the Beatles, uh, uh, so some, uh, the bus started Paul McCartney coming back to Liverpool to play something and there's a shot of a, a little video of a guy just totally melts. Mm -hmm. This is a big older gentleman and just completely melts sort of thing. Um, it, so is I mean that, is that also, is that also is that part of the research that you're doing is to try and and, and to some to some extent establish that link if you will a therapeutic link for for people? Yeah, so I think um, it's a great point that you raise about I mean this 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 often happens quite spontaneously so we don't necessarily choose music for that purpose um, and so it's been shown that music is a really good cue for involuntary memories and they kind of come up spontaneously and so on so it's not something that like I said that we kind of um, a lot of times use purposely in our everyday lives but considering like, the various kind of positive benefits that it can have um, I, it'd be something I'd be really interested in, in exploring in future how we can actually harness this and try and actually, um, yeah, purposefully implement this in, mm -hmm. in uh, obviously it is used in, in music therapy for kind of people with, like I said, with, with different um, memory disorders or different conditions, but actually the degree to which we could use it just in our everyday life for an mm -hmm. enhancing well-being, I think is really important. Cool, Chloe, thank you so much. Cheers, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>